Don't get too comfortable. It doesn't end. Day after day, it's the same problem until we stop it. And I don't think that really happens. If you can keep it, you have what you have if you can keep it. And I don't see us doing that. And I, don't, I know a lot of people don't like hearing that, but I don't know what else to say. I don't. I try to see the better side, sides of things that we can back off and not have to do much, but I don't, I, I just don't get it. Uh, I don't see that. I don't get how that's going to work. And I don't know why that is, because that's not me. I just soon let, you know, well, live and let live. That's how we were brought up. That's what we were told anyway. And then we found out there was a reality. We found out there's lots of people out there puffing a lot of smoke in our face. And we believed it because that's the way we were told too. And we started to find out something was amiss. And now we're here. And all we see is the problems and not a lot of ways to fix it. And then I did my research, I tried to do my research and found out some things that did start to work. And so that becomes something like BTW274 for this episode, Behind the Woodshed. And you can hear us, for those of you hearing us anywhere else, every live, every Sunday, over at uh, rlmradio.xyz. rlmradio.xyz is the simplest way I can get you there. Or go to reallibertymedia.com. That's the origins, and then we go through Spreaker, and then we go to YouTube, and then off into wherever I can put it at night. Post-production, I'm here. I just didn't realize it, but I'm here in this seat from probably, uh, well, 15 hours on a day, on a Sunday. And I'm uh, here a few hours before uh, before, uh, at the night on Sunday, on Saturday, excuse me. So uh, as much as I can compress my time into this, uh, this ability, it still takes time. And to get the word out to everybody, and so... I do appreciate it when people take the time to do more uh, reminding on minds or promotions or sending out a link or discuss, making discussions on the subject matter. Uh, but one thing I need to say again, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, you can't listen to me for five minutes or ten minutes, a half hour, and really understand fully what I'm actually telling you. I, you can get little bits of it, but this is an ongoing process of learning. And I think anybody who jumps into this this late in the game, they realize they're in a pretty stiff river that they're swimming upstream in. And so we can work out things together. Once we get involved, we can start learning on the, uh, certainly, certainly learning on the job of, of working this out. But there's a, it takes a whole other mindset than anybody than uh, I've ever heard uh, who thinks that they're approaching all this, who thinks they have a say. This all takes a different mindset than what I've heard most people uh, do. And when we, we finally jump in, uh, we people find out really quickly. It's kind of like when I was diving, you're supposed to be certified for certain things. Well, I'm a miner. We go out in the river. No, I didn't go certified as a river miner, a diver, but we do that all the time. You learn you, you, with with the basics, which are what you should have, you end up teaching yourself on the job. And it's uh, not in a, where, where literally your, your life is on the line if you make a mistake. And so this is where you start, you start to fortify yourself in your own skill set as you move along too. So... Uh, one, those of you that are passing the word around, appreciate it. Those that you step up and start trying to make heads or tails of this, I I know that's the, it's kind of a disoriented type place. You got to make a point. You see a problem and you want to fix it, and then it may take a couple steps back actually to reassess. So I said you have to do, look at all this, look at the battlefield, and re- do your assessments, and then move forward. And uh, that may take a whole new turn than what you thought it was. And that's you also preparing yourself. So what I do behind the woodshed is just hopefully, I know I'm telling you the principles, whether or not you receive them, that's really kind of up to you, and I hope you're here to you're here to do that, so 10 minutes isn't going to do it, half hour isn't going to do it, I'm not here to tell you to listen to me all the time, but it's going to take a while because of the way I have to go through this, I have no direction from y'all, uh, when I do, we we work, we get right to work, and uh, when you when you bring up something you're interested in, I get, we get right to work on it, but uh, so, so those of you that, and I appreciate them, but those of you that mark a thumbs down, I get those about once every three, two to three months. Got another one on mines. Uh, that doesn't help me to help you, 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 unless you just throw throw the baby out with the bathwater. Those of you that want to do a thumb down, I'm more interested in what you have to say because I want to see where it is that we may uh, I may have it wrong, or you you may have it wrong, and that's okay. I don't have a problem with anybody's opinion. Uh, you're going to have it wrong until you figure out how to get it right. You're going to keep standing out, running out in front of that bus until you figure out that uh, maybe you had it wrong. Uh, I don't know what the thumbs down means. 
make a comment. Tell me what it is. Maybe you didn't like last week. Maybe you didn't like when I was telling you that uh, MAGA to me is just uh, the letters that mean my, my my armadillo gonna angst. Maybe it, maybe you're all politically wired up to have to embrace MAGA. I don't know. Uh, but um, maybe, I don't know, maybe you have a problem with my armadillo. I, I don't know either. I'm glad I didn't say my my uh, antelope gonna an- angst because then now you'd be kind of angry at both of those animals. And now what? See, it's not a point. There's nothing there. You, thumbs down doesn't mean nothing to me. I can pick up and make a joke out of most any of it because it doesn't have a point. And we are in a place where we have to have our point, and I don't mean just our opinions. I think the bit, one of the biggest things to find out is when you get into, into, the, uh, into dealing with the wrongs against us, it's, it looks like, the, well, the game is rigged. I mean, you, don't even, you look at it, it's just overwhelming. How, how are we going to get at this thing? Your opinions mean nothing there. And that's the whole point about what I keep trying to tell you. You can go ahead and have all your thoughts. You can have all your mythologies and all your ro- warm and fuzzy feelings. But that's just you living up to the expectation of the oppressor. It's really simple how they've done that to us. And uh, though a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people will think they're in an exalted place. I see this in the scientists so-called all the time. They didn't realize they were specialized. Got on that little special bus. We all got pigeonholed and we all did it to ourselves. While the game, the major comprehensive game was being played, they got us pigeonholed into thinking we were something and, and telling us the world was our oyster and all that stuff, and we believed it all. And I guess in some regards it would be, but not underneath that oppression that we find. It plays out in every place that we go. And uh, so, to combat that, I come here once a week. Um, Grimner p- puts up the reallibertymedia.com website, and we have another website that's going to go down again. I guess we're going to live... Uh, Live by the seat of our pants at freedomsnetwork.com. It's censorship-free network, and nobody comes to support it. It's pretty fascinating, but barely bleeding it out. And again, thank you for whoever's doing that. Eat once a month is a new a new donation. We need about we need to do a lot better than this, folks. We need to take these tools and actually step up with them and actually work them together. My mind says we could do it easily. It's just a matter of coming together. And what we end up doing is fighting with each other, and we end up going down our own little uh, well, we all have to go down our road. That's not really a problem. It's it's just that we don't understand how to really look at uh, My view is we don't understand how to look at things. We don't need to understand intuitively how to look at um, the non-intuitiveness of it all. And that seems to hurt a lot of people. Uh, you, you think you can, people that are working in their hands they, or their minds that they work things through like engineers really don't get this. Uh, people who want to get things done and they think you can just do it by putting your, your, your shoulder to the to the to the load to the wagon it, it doesn't work that way this thing has really been wired uh, and operates a com- lot a lot of it's counterintuitive and yet it can be addressed and it's addressed by objective basis not by opinions ideas things that you thought uh, things that you you say ought to be none of that is is relevant what is reality is what's relevant and you looking at that truly uh, in an ob- objective basis and then coming to apply an objective basis to it is what extinguishes it because it's a lie you all know that and you'll talk about it and you'll complain about it but hardly anybody will really put their uh, their nose to the grindstone and grind that thing up uh, put their shoulder to the load to the wagon uh, put their back into it you know bow their neck to the point and do the right thing lift the weight tote the barge whatever the heck it is you want to you want to say you have to do no one wants to come at this right. You'll argue with me, or you you put up uh, irrelevant stuff to the to a, a non-point, and uh, no one really wants to take the. the well, no, I said no. I keep saying no one, but it, it's a general no one. They're just not 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 willing to, to step up. And I think a lot of that they, we we know we know what we're going to have to get into if we actually roll our sleeves up and decide we're going to do this. And it's uh, then and then you step into it and you find out how daunting it. It can be, and I've worked out quite a bit of things for myself. I tried to tell you some of those things here and explain how we go about addressing these wrongs we see uh, that we see that we need to make right that we see that an organization we call government is doing. And it's really, I, my view is it's not. It's individual people that are taking advantage of the color of that government. And when, what I just I find for you right there is a felony, it's a crime against you. As soon as someone takes the color of the government authority, and they use it to hurt you, or they use it under the color authority to do some interference with you or an infringement, that is a felony. 
I don't know why people have such a complicated look at all this. Does it sound? Not any harder than that. The problem is there's so many places, so many people in so many places in, now that there are, these felons are everywhere. And there's really, it's a hard time, a hard thing to get accountability. And my view on that is also numbers. Uh, you know, Jeff, I keep going to Jefferson because that's the first earliest thing I could see in, in the construct called the United States of America where someone said, you know, it's going to take the mass of people to keep down the oppressors. They, they, the caucusocracy is the nat- is the nat- natural law. It, it, the things that have power and force and, and where violence can be used attract the worst. That's just that's a rule, a law of nature, and we tend to we want to tell you, well, we got the natural law. We don't understand the first thing about it. A lot of us we want to talk about it. No, and no one will actually start utilizing it. They just talk about it, and this is part of my problem, uh, generally. But. Uh, off my tab here. I'll, let me get back. I, I want to get back. I hope uh, you enjoyed last week's uh, discussion. Uh, the uh, was this the four A fantasy four A or was it a future fact? We're talking about the uh, USS Death Star and the neon organoid controlled dro- killer drones and all this technology that sits there to be put together uh, to. Uh, to make the next big jump by the biggest dominator in the in the universe that we know of, looking to dominate the universe, the United States of America at this point, the military, the caucusocracy. What I didn't get to talk about, and I put the links in last week's blogcaster, was just a little thing. I'm just going to touch base here. It's a, a an interesting thing, for, at least for me. It was something I thought I wanted. I was thinking to try and get into. I'm in a transit. My technological experience is in a time and transition between two types of technology and two types of construction of technology in the things electronic. And it was really neat to see that. And I look back and say, well, that was pretty neat. We're we're so far beyond it all. And so much more so-called capable uh, that it's uh, kind of a neat, it's a way, I guess, way you can say it's nostalgic to look back. But uh, what I didn't touch on with all this uh, space talk was the, we talked about the moon and we talked about the Death Star and we talked about all these things about the fact that we may have the ability to make um, machines that are beyond what our our capacity on Earth is, and limited have been limited by our thoughts. Uh, well, you know, and for as much as we may uh, not believe what we've been told, there's a there was some things I wanted to talk about last week that uh, we were not told correctly. Doesn't mean that I'm going to say that we did any of the stuff that they claim they did. What I'm saying is that and there's more examples of what goes on that uh, we're not given. We're, we really are a repressed people. And this is another proof of it. And when you see what, what men and women did at the time, and what they did it with, slide rules, <laughs> uh, is, is, and just, just huge creativity, it is really a phenomenal thing to, that I came through that inspired me before, before reality set in about what we, can, what we tend to do and what comes on, what our, uh, the real science and, and applied science can do. We have evidence now. It comes 40, 50 years late. Uh, but here here we have it. And it was done, you have to understand, that the technology then was different. And it was actually constructed different. But I had a long time uh, time ago, I thought I could see the transition from all these monstrously framed computer systems and tape readers and all this. And I wanted to start collecting them up. And they started coming on sale. And I said to my mind, I said to myself, I said, Self, uh, these machines are going to do something in the future to maintain the records and reproduce the records of the past. And I'd like to have those machines available. And at the time, I knew the, I knew the technology, so it was, uh, it was uh, one of those things you just kind of, I felt, I'll just keep these things and keep them in repair. And, and, and in the future, they'll become an archival machine to take the data that, that we moved from, because we went from analog now into digital. And we will, we will use these computers of old, these monstrous computers, uh, to to redo it. Well, there's a project that actually came up, and they did that, which that's why I was interested in this in this thing. But what they sh- explained to this in this project regarding the moon and the pictures of the moon, and the evidence that the government will give you the worst, almost the worst, just barely enough to see, when in fact the the government has its capacity, speaks to the fact of the advances that are already in the system before you even get it. But it also speaks to the fact that the government will keep from you for whatever spacious reason. Uh, things that really are mind-blowing in a way, 
And uh, to my mind, because of the repression, we we are repressed people in our creativity. We don't see, we're not led by examples of of, of greatness in application. Uh, the moon, Mech Moon, how the earliest images of the moon were so much better than we realized. Well, realized we didn't know. We were only listening to what we were told, and we were only fed so much. But uh, 50 uh, years ago, five unmanned lunar orbiters circled the moon, taking extremely high-resolution photos of the surface. They were trying to find the perfect landing site for the Apollo missions. They would be good enough, these pictures would be good enough to blow up to 40 by 50 feet. An image that could be blown up to 40 feet by 54 feet, excuse me. 54 feet, so that the image of the astronauts could walk around on these images looking for the best spot. After their use, the images were locked away from the public until after the bulk of the moon landings, as at the time they would have revealed the superior technology of the United States' spy satellite cameras, which the orbiter cameras were designed from. The main worry was the, guess what, folks, the perpetual enemy here. The U, well, now it's changed. Today it's Putin. Putin, it's Russia. Well, then it was the USSR. This is the ongoing nemesis excuse to keep knowledge and technology from you. But at any rate, the main worry was the USSR gaining valuable information about landing sites that the U.S. wanted to use. The 1970, in 1971, many of the images were released, but nowhere near their potential quality, and mainly to an academic audience, as a public interest as public interest in the moon waned. And so we see also what, again, you're guided by what you promoted here as well. We Our interest went away. We haven't supposedly been back. If we ever went, all these stories now pop up. Uh, but the point is, is here is the technology. What, what we do and what's kept from us, but what we still can do when we're focused on solving problems. And at the time, uh, at this time, I remember the people that were working on these problems uh, behind the scenes, the companies like uh, like Land with Polaroid and uh, Kodak Films uh, were, uh, I think, highly underappreciated for the geniuses that they were, uh, that they people were inside these uh, these uh, uh, companies that you just didn't hear hear of, and partly because there was a national security blockade on a lot of this stuff. Uh, again, you're seeing that they'll they'll say NSNA. SA, NASA, is a civil air, air corps, but it's actually military, and it's always really has been. So up until 2008, most of the, un, the reported images were uh, uh, from the project were the 1966 version of the grainy and lower quality. And they show an example here, and I'll get, again, go back to last week's broadcast. You got three links. You can see how this was done, what they did. The first image is, looks, it was pretty pathetic. It looked like a um, thermal image printer. Uh, where you have the, if it's not aligned right, you got the lines that run, uh, run well, this way we run up and down the page, they run across the page. Uh, and a thermal printer head that wasn't aligned, it looks just like this, pretty, really highly low quality. It's very low uh, number of, I think there was only nine, they made a picture out of nine little pixels, uh, nine little burn spots on a piece of paper. And uh, we made our mind, make, uh, that's a pretty fantastic thing to make up pictures with this. But that's all they fed, they fed us back in the 60s. And all the way up until just this project, this McMoon project, where they took these, images these these files and the technology that they did in order to make a file that size for the resolution is quite fascinating to read and any of you that are uh, nerds or dorks or geeks that would be in, should be interested in, in how they did this uh, to take the type of technology they had and make the quality of images that they had that would be on Im pictures that were put together that were 40 by 54 feet in size that you could literally walk on and you can use a microscope uh, a magnifying glass to look at the surface of the moon now these new pictures i'm going to just say for those of you that are skeptics uh, these pictures may or may not also be doc uh, uh, be the ones that they created from the old data may or may not be doctored too but that's a uh, for someone else to figure out i was just interested that they took an old mainframe machine they had to repair some of these recorders. They put the whole system together. They made a converter system that went from the old system to our new computers. And then they took all this information, gigabytes of information, and they run them through the new computer, and they were able to regenerate these images that no one had ever seen, uh, or at least nothing and nobody in the public had ever seen. 
uh, the, uh, the, va- the the machines were available. What, what got me was the picture of the machines and made me smile. These are the types of machines I wanted to start storing up, but that didn't work out. I, I ended up getting one small system, but it was a bookkeeping system. These big mainframe computers, I thought they were pretty neat. Uh, but here it is. I'm looking at the same type of machine, but there you're actually doing images, uh, uh, taking and converting the old technology. See, the transition of the new technology needs to have a crossover point, and this was this project. Really fascinating project also about how they do that. But the point was that they had technology back then that the public never, ever saw. And to me, that was, a, again, it's a sad thing because this is, a, we had no no uh, examples of how to, how somehow your mind works with the new examples. There's a momentum in creativity. And we were all, our whole society, lots of societies under the threat of somebody's uh, fear-mongering uh, were diminished because of all this. But I don't want to talk too deep on that side, but just rolls and rolls and rolls of film. See, they couldn't take actually film. They had to take a signal. They, they, I don't know how they actually did this in the satellites, but they couldn't transfer film. No film was ever transferred in this technology. Today, that, that, that digital technology is what they do to get the pictures, but they didn't have all that then. They had to use analog. It's really, a, again, fascinating from a, a geek standpoint, how they did that, how they came up with it. It was really a fascinating story. Anyway, you get some pretty interesting pictures, kind of neat stuff. I still see things in them, not not the real weird stuff. I'm just saying you look at pictures that you see and you say, wow, what, Just if an, even if in a natural capacity, what's creating these things? Why are they created like this? And it, your mind starts to, con, to see better because you have the image in your mind now that's clear, not a thermal image nine-point printer printout, but an actual clear image. It, you're, you're, it really brings on that um, that awe in a way, uh, and so there was a big project about this. They fulfilled it. Uh, if you're interested, I got the image, uh, the uh, links for this. Um, using old technology had to be put together. Uh, some technicians of today, scientists of today, were able to do all that. It took the combined effort uh, to do this. They they did it. I think it looked like a Moffett Field where the blimp hangers were, and they did this project inside of an old McDonald's at. Uh, that uh, had gone and gone down, I guess, on the base down there when they privatized it or something. I'm not quite sure what happened, but anyway, they they had a place to do this, and all these images are now uh, the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project are on the internet for y'all if you're if you're interested. And I just think it was a cool a cool project, uh, bringing the past forward, and the past the past wasn't so primitive. I guess that's my main gripe here: the past isn't so primitive. Now, well, that's what bugs me about today's digital cameras. I'm a, I'm in photography. That's the other thing. The other image about this, the other thing about this. I'm in photography, uh, and uh, so I've been really disappointed in our uh, digital technology and cameras. And it's really for for my well, not necessarily anymore. With my eyes uh, changing, sl- uh, altering now, uh, they're not as uh, not as keen as they used to be. But even so, the old technology film is very hard to replicate digitally. It's just now the technology just now may be able to get to the point of having enough data can data bandwidth in order to to rep mimic uh, uh, what a film did then, and, and so we're we're not we're trained out of the technology we're adapted to lesser technology even though it's really cool it's really fat much faster too and you don't need to have a whole, any processing systems, uh, but the technology jump is kind of an interesting observation in this story. Uh, so that's another thing for those of us that are looking into where does tech, how is technology, how are we being lied to, what can it be? Uh, that was back in the 50 years ago they had this quality of stuff. And I'm just saying going into digital not necessarily was a good jump. And so they, again, this is, uh, those of us that uh, were inspired by really excellence, notwithstanding all of our skepticism now about the stories or whether we did or didn't or whatever, but all of us that were growing up in through this creative excellence, even though we didn't get to see most of it, we still were, it was like a, a ripple effect. And sometime after that, we, our, I could tell myself, I could tell our society was going into a different, a different mode. And, and you look today and we don't have those kinds of people around. These are people that made these, these designs, come up with these ideas out of their mind, first of all, and did then they did the they had the, the background in the math and the science and they used a lot of times they just used they used to use slide rules and so with very we think of it being primitive but these simple tools were used to do some pretty fantastic things that I can only I mean I don't even know if I can imagine 
what it what they're doing. So last week's discussion of this is a is this a fantasy foray or a future fact? Uh, there's no I didn't I wasn't able to close it with this difference. Fifty years ago, between what they what they told us they had and what they had, it didn't make what I was telling you last week uh, too outside the limits. I don't think it is anyway, but I mean, this is the stuff, the unknown to us, the public, the people, uh, is uh, really a blind spot. And I think we've been, really, as I said it, we've been stunted as a society. And that's part of us, was part of us to maintain. Again, this is a lot of a, a lot of a, on us. I don't know what we would have done at this point, as I'm talking to everybody now, because we've allowed it. But this is how easy it is for societies to slip into mediocrity. And that's where I come in in the 90s, or actually the 80s, and then I started getting focused where the Internet started to come in. I got a little bit more access, middle 90s, to the seeing what other people were saying. And I started to say, hey, this is, this is going down the tubes, and it's going down the tubes into everybody. It's the, uh, well, the normalization of ignorance. This is the website, uh, the YouTube account. It's the normalization of ignorance. It's just mediocrity. It's the new Middle Ages of the Middle Road. It's complete compromise, completely unable to see how you can take primitive tools and do some really remarkable things. And again, I'm, I'm in a way I'm disappointed because I, I came up through this remarkable time and then saw it, saw it destroyed and squandered. In fact, I just saw in a Twitter today, someone said, who's uh, saying I didn't need math when I went through science. And she apparently got through it it was I said she particularly because uh, as a male at the time that they did that to me I didn't make it through it because of the potent all the different programs that came out to exalt uh, well affirmative action came out and so that no matter what they closed my 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 experience was the closure of avenues to uh, to education one of the things they told me is that I couldn't do uh, I couldn't do chemistry because I didn't have math uh, and what I found astonishing is I was a, a state, um, for, for uh, my high school, I was the state, high school state representative to a statewide test that was given to the highest level chemistry students. And I go into college and they tell me I can't move into chemistry until I have more math. Apparently, I didn't need their math. And so this, thought, this statement from this woman today hit pretty 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 direct on my experience that the so-called science was being specialized how she squeaked through is interesting i'd like to know how she did that they wouldn't let me pass but she squeaked through with her science uh, without the math but this is what they were doing before you were able to do things before in the creativity side of it and you had the training behind that uh, to to make it so as an engineer and so there was a differentiation uh, there's a generalization and then a, and a differentiation and application. And then there became a specialization. I don't think, in my experience and view, that has been a good thing for our society. What am I saying? Well, I'm telling us, telling you, that the generalization and the specialization is what you're reflecting, what is coming, is what you're dealing with when you go out and deal with anybody. And that, that specialization that has been given to people is not as, as, expert as i could say as we say as as they might think and this be, poses us a problem because those are the people that are in the seat to decision and it, it's part of what i use i'm looking at all these def deficiencies in us uh, as guided by my experience coming through this time of a massive creativity of doing very astonishing things at the same time you see the government was also uh, repressing the knowledge of it all and then moving us into a different different um, lifestyle essentially and then here we come in through and not seeing the fulfillment of all this like you have a lot of people of, of uh, are, are said uh, when they started to hear about then about social security they realized it wasn't going to be necessarily be a really here uh, when we got here and so and for the most part it's kind of here but it's really not and there's lots of now programs in the way that obstruct you from it. And then your retirement goes off into the 70s. This was all understood back when the fail the creativity was being stifled. You could see it. You could see the society being turned down and being turned into these specialists. I know them now as adju adjunct scientists, with, or um, not adjunct, but uh, adjective scientists. They got some thing 
some adjective in front of their name and they think that they're this this knowledge. And you ask them the most basic question and now they're smart enough to figure out, well, if I answer them in the truth, uh, then I'm going to show that I don't know what's going on here even though I'm promoting something. If I answer them what's legal, I can get away with it. And this is where the agencies that you'll be dealing with are. They answer in the legal. doesn't have to be true. doesn't have to be right. It just has to be the standard that they apply. And so the standard that was applied for these pictures was you're going to get a thermal image printing. What they had... And it's just fascinating technology how they did it. But what they had was uh, beyond. It was beyond belief what they could actually do. And in some regard, I don't know if it went any better because they went to digital, but I saw with these new multiple I uh, digital systems now, I, I think that they're building up the latitude, the uh, bandwidth in the picture, uh, the digital, in order to start creating these pictures that they had back when. So we get people, the, the consumer gets a lot less, highly le degraded quality. Consider that now. You're in a consumer society. How much less quality is our life? And how much more responsibility than if we look out that we were, it was on us to keep up and we didn't? It is this thing I've run across that I've been trying to get us, uh, I wish I was more motivational, but I'm trying to get us motivated to say we really have something to do here. And we do have something to do, and it's doable, if I can use that. I just despise that term, but it can be done if we just roll up our sleeves and, and focus on something. Because what's uh, what's to be done is so much better and so much greater than we are experiencing now. We are living the plan, someone else's plan that put us here, repressed us, and kept and keeps us as an oppression. Now, we can go through all kinds of discussions on where that might have been. We can go through, eh, we got, I told you before, we can go ahead and point our finger at all kinds of things. And ultimately, it was you're going to get back to the, the one that we're pointing the fingers everywhere. Uh, there's three pointing back every time saying, we had to stop that somehow. And I look back and see what they did and the creative energy that happened and what, what they did with that. And I said, we could just turn that into our problem right now. I think we're done with this problem pretty quickly. The the question is is do we do we do that or do we continue to fight amongst ourselves? Moving on to what the government does, and again, my thread here a bit is this: our response to the things that the government says is a, a provide they gave us the things they give us. Uh, this is to look at the standards that they they the. The standards they provide, but then they look at the reason underpinning it and look at how we kind of have to address this. And that one of the, the t problems is the time delay of harm. The time delay of, of, well, in a case like the pictures, it's not a harm. But we found out we could have been much more inspired. We could have had a much better view. Uh, what we could have seen, we could have been more, more engaged. Uh, that could have changed our opinion about lots of things. I don't know. As a society. Uh, but this is but we go into the government and it we now know that it will repress you it will keep information back it creates systems and excuses that'll do that in my view has been lately in the last decade or so ways of subverting all that I, I've told you before and I'll get to the right quickly the national security that that will be the hardest one that you meet but for the most part most people won't meet that and what I told you how you meet that is you meet national security need with a national security imperative that you have, and that's where I found mining. Uh, mining is a is one of the one of those things. There's very few that can do this, but mining is one of them. Uh, so there's a way to meet that, but most people won't be there. So we don't have to worry that uh, we can't meet this national security obstruction. Uh, but we're not talking national security when we get onto our health, and we're not talking about national security when we get into the things that have agency uh, agency guidelines and what they give us and what they allow. Uh, which looks like an obstruction. And here was a story that finally came through in the delay. The repression of information gave a delay. The standard that they impose uh, gave a delay where it allows, after finally finding out, uh, finding the study that someone finally come around to point out that harm is being led, uh, been allowed upon us in ways that the agency would not look at which is, I think, those of you that are thinking about engaging agency, you have to really look at this part of it. The standard that they use, the thing that they look at, has to be put up against what their actual mission is and 
what their actual duty is. In this case, we have a story now for those of you that are not going to escape this, and this is an interesting uh, condition. And as I said, we they, they repressed us. They repressed our capacity as people. Persistent associations between maternal prenatal exposure to phthalates on child IQ at age 7 was uh, posted in the journals of uh, plos.org, a study. And they sh- uh, find that the prior research uh, reports inverse associations between maternal prenatal urinary phthalate metabolite concentrations and mental and motor development in preschoolers. No study evaluated whether these associations persist into school age. This is a critical thing that goes on. And you'll notice, and I'm going to give you an example of this, this is what the government does, makes a standard, and they say that they're there for a reason, and then they don't go do this study that they should be doing. They go do a study that's really kind of off on the weed, in the weeds somewhere, and they make that important. And no one's been around to check it. No study evaluated whether associations persist into school age. That's a, just a, to me, a just terrifying thought. These agencies will get away with allowing chemistry, uh, chemi- chemicals in your life, that they don't check the actual cause for. They check a use, but they don't check the causation. Methods in the follow-up of 328 inner-city mothers and their children, we measured prenatal urinary metabolites of dienbutyl phthalate, butyl benzyl phthalate, diisobutyl phthalate, and exyl ethyl exyl phthalate and diethyl phthalate in late pregnancy. The Weichler Intelligence Scale for Children 4th Edition was administered at children child age 7 years and evaluates four areas of cognitive function associated with overall intelligence quotient. Results. Child full-scale IQ was inversely associated with prenatal urinary metabolite concentrations. Uh, well, I'll stop there. You can read it if you're interested. Let me give the, the conclusion of their study. Uh, maternal, maternal prenatal urinary metabolite concentrations measured in late pregnancy of DNPB and DIPBP are associated with deficits in children's intellectual development at age 7 years because phthalate exposures are ubiquitous and concentrations seen here within the range previously observed among general populations result Results are of pub, public health significance. In other words, the, this phthalate compound, ubiquitous everywhere, reduces uh, child IQ by this study. And I want to point out how the, uh, now point you to the idea when you're looking at what agencies do, how they look at the wrong thing and they claim that's good enough. And if no one's there to challenge it, they get they get what they want. They get this thing into the, the system. What is a phthalate? It's spelled with the P-H, T-H, A-L-A-T-E. The P-H is silent for those of us that can't read. Never seen this stuff because we never got to go to chemistry class. At any rate, it's, a, it's an esterous of phthalic acid. And these were the, these esters, if you had a chemistry class, were the things you made of all the things you made that made a smell. This is how, how, you, how you, you add an acid to an alcohol and it makes a, a, a byproduct which is aromatic. Uh, really cool things. It's how you make all these different smells, these synthetic odors are how this is done. Uh, really cool stuff at some point. Uh, they are mainly used in plasticizers, uh, i.e. substances added to plastics to increase their flexibility, transparency, durability, and longevity. They are used primarily to soften polyvinyl chloride. They're in plastics, folks. Where aren't you going to find this in your all y'all that drink bottled water? Look, the Nestle's or somebody, any company buys up all the all the fresh water out of the spring. Uh, they then make your wells go dry. They make your agriculture go down, uh, and then you complain because you don't have any good water. And they'll sell you back that fresh water in a plastic bottle with a phthalate. You don't think this is a plan to make your little ones uh, have an IQ less than what it ought to have been? I, I, it, it, it's completely within possibility. These things are ubiquitous. This plasticizer is everywhere. This stuff can be used to the point where you can make plastic like a, it makes it plastic like a gummy worm. 
not a gummy worm. It's plastic that's gummy like a gummy worm. That's the utility of this is far reaching. So that's what this stuff is. And then uh, you can those of us that uh, may have a dryer and you and you like those sm- smelly those nice smelling uh, uh, clothes and you want to put a a dryer sheet in, in inside the the dryer. Well, th- that the phthalates are in there too. And so here we got we smelled all these aromatics. We're smelling our th- a lot of times they're these phthalates. Uh, what's uh, what's in your dryer your dryer sheets and fabric softener, folks? You want soft clothes? There's phthalates in there. You put it on your skin, you're going to absorb this stuff. If you're in this case, this is a study just for for uh, pregnant women. Uh, this is going to everybody. This is getting into everybody's system. It's going to have different r- responses that apparently nobody checks. There's no other study has been done in this case. Uh, now we have this condition of lowered IQ. Seven points, folks. I would predict a lot of those may become cops. Uh, fabric softeners, dryer sheets, fabric sprays, and now laundry crystals. Most American laundry rooms are beginning to look like home chemistry labs. Better living through chemistry, folks. They told us all about this. Liquids, gels, foams, and fragrances are mixed and remixed in a never-ending and uh, quite ironic search for freshness. It makes me wonder what exactly our clothes and linens are going through that requires them to be so thoroughly and aggressively treated. The uh, point was, I just wanted to make out, make out here to you, not make out with you, but for you, the uh, the fact that this stuff is in all these clean, so-called cleaning, uh, the the cleaning. I just want to show the ubiquitousness. We don't know these places. These things are everywhere. It's not just plastic. It's even in your in your soap. It, it's 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 all over. And this is the ubiquitous nature of this. We we've been brought up in through this. And here's what the FDA does with this. You know. Remember, I was telling you to one of the, the techniques is to look for the things that are not spoken about, which means you have to understand those are there to be spoken about. That's probably that's the second problem in this. You have to be aware, and then you have to be aware that they didn't speak about something that they ought to have been aware of, and that's the ought is what they're not doing. You would have to press forward. And this is why I keep telling you: you look at a problem, you may have to take a couple steps back before you can address that problem because you have to get at the beginning of the failure. And so we have a question now. Do you want your sons and daughters to have IQs of uh, uh, lowered IQs uh, because the, your world is in, is polluted with a phthalate? Now there there's some there's some things they can do to get rid of those, and some companies are, and they're on. They may be on their way out as there's new chemistry, uh, new uh, organics coming together to work very similar to the to the way the the, the uh, phthalate works. Uh, but this is still, we're in an environment that's over, just completely uh, ubiquitous. Still ubiquitous. Still, the study says it's ubiquitous. It's not like it's got a little niche place. It's everywhere. How does the FDA treat this? And this is where I want to get to analyzing this and how you start to look at silence uh, inside of things. The FDA has received a number of inquiries of the safety of phthalates, uh, which are used in a variety of cosmetics as well as other consumer products. Now, let me get to the point. FDA means Food and Drug Administration. Food and Drug. Now, what did they say? They say phthalates are used in a variety of cosmetics as well as other consumer products. And they're responding to inquiries to the Food and Drug Administration over phthalate use in cosmetics. Uh, can I suggest right up front, they're going to get to the point when they give, this is like a little FAQ, a fact. They're going to tell you they don't have a jurisdiction over phthalates in cosmetics. And yet this is on phthalates, generally, this whole topic. And there's their first problem right there, the silence as to them speaking within their authority. And you can predict somewhere in these FAQs they're going to tell you they have no Thing to say about it. And so this is how you start to build how, and I would be taking, I'm telling you here on the air, but I'd be taking notes of my observations, whether that's handwritten or whether you want to get on a little notepad and type it out. And I'd be making these bullet points as I'm working through. I do this in my mind normally, and I usually end up doing a writing later. But for some of you that need to keep up uh, for yourself and so you don't get lost, because it gets kind of, the list can get very long. It's kind of like after you do this a while, you get to you keep that you know that list is going to be long. You make room for it in how you how your concentration works. But they're already talking outside their authority. 
And so that's the first note. Then they talk about it in the concept of cosmetics and consumer products. They don't list the consumer products uh, as any groups. But they tell you, they agree, they're all over the place. Uh, it's funny, I found out they don't say it's in food. Uh, phthalates are a group of chemicals used of hundreds of products such as toys, vinyl flooring, wall covering, detergent, lawn lu lubricating oils, food packaging, pharmaceuticals, well, we got two now in their jurisdiction, blood bags and tubing, personal care products such as nail polish, hairsprays, aftershave, lotions, soaps, shampoos, perfumes, and other fragrance preparations. So doesn't that study we read, that's confirmed by the FDA's knowledge. And so I found two or three things here, blood bags, uh, that could be considered a drug a drug. Uh, uh, can, can, uh, uh, thing, uh, I can't remember, the word's not coming to me, it came and flew away, uh, where you give people through which drugs come through, they could be in their jurisdiction. But they're talking about cosmetics here. They listed here and confirmed phthalates are really ubiquitous, just like, this, just like that study. How phthalates have been used in cosmetics. Well, okay, let's learn how, th how phthalates are used in cosmetics, because this, this thing on phthalates is based on questions about cosmetics. Again, no questions on food, no questions on anything else, just on cosmetics. And they keep very carefully focused on this. It's not clear what effect phthalates in human, phthalates in human health. It's not a clear what effect, if any, phthalates have on health, human health. An expert panel convened in 1998 to 2000 by the National Toxicology Program, part of the National Institute for the Environmental Safety and Health, concluded that reproductive risks from exposure to phthalates were minimal to negligible in most cases. Reproductive risks. Apparently your IQ is not a reproductive risk. And they, they didn't look at it anyway. Remember, no study had been done up until this recent one about the IQ. And then post-birth. The Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, remember now, they just went to two so-called experts, and now they're going to another agency, the CDC, Disease Control and Prevention, released a report on March 21st, 2001, titled The National Report on Human Exposure to Environmental Chemicals. The report described a survey of a small segment of the United States population for environmental chemicals in urine. One group of chemical survey was phthalates. However, the CDC survey was not intended to make an association between the presence of environmental chemicals in ur human urine and disease, but rather the, to learn more about the extent of human exposure to industrial chemicals. Now, can I just interject here on, on this? Did your mind say what? What kind of nonsense is that? Why would they make a study on the exposure without looking and doing the step to the cause when their the CDC is about what? It said it. Control, the disease control and prevention. This is an important focus. This study was not done to find an impact. It was just done to do the existence. It seems to me to be a failure of their mission. The purpose of being. And so, to me, a comment, an addressment of this absence, this silence of what should be what they're doing, is what you bring forward in a simple statement. To challenge these things that now we see will go for years and years and years because no study was done, no demand was made, and someone comes along to do it and we find, we do find a harm. And it happens to be with the capacity of your little ones 10 years ago. And any of you all that may have been or may not have been involved with however many phthalates in this condition, in your past. But the CDC was not, the survey was not intended to make an association between the presence of environmental chemicals in human urine and disease. Why is the answer you bring up? Now you petition to make it happen be the fact that that's what they do on all of these things. And we know the reason why, after you look at this a while, they don't want to find a causation, do they? It's about the bottom line. And so right here in the F, uh, FDA statement, they're talking about something the FDA, I can tell you, has no jurisdiction over right there, and they refer you to the CDC who won't look at it. 
In 2002, the Cosmetic Ingredient Review Expert Panel reaffirmed its original conclusion reached in 1985, finding that the DB, DBP, DMP, and DEP were safe as used in cosmetics. The study didn't limit it to cosmetics, folks. It just, it's ubiquitous. Looking at a, just talking about that exists here. Uh, the, looking at the maximum known concentration of these ingredients in cosmetics, the panel evaluated phthalate exposure and toxicity da data and conducted a safety assessment for di dibutyl phthalate in cosmetic products. Folks, how do you do that when you don't have a standard for safety? Is another bullet point. You haven't developed a standard for safety. Why? Because you never did the studies for causation. You just blew right past two big important points and problems. The CIR is an industrial sponsored organization that reviews cosmetic ingredient safety and publishes its results in open peer reviewed literature. Who cares if it's not looking at the right thing? You ask the wrong question, you get the right answer, folks. This is just, these things are just methodologically inserted into the system over and over, and we just watch it like, we, like it's supposed to be correct. And this is, you're seeing here, an industry-sponsored organization is considered the expert here. Now, I'm not worried about, even if I wasn't worried about conflict of interest, if they were honest, it's still limited to what they want to look and the question they're going to ask. This is why I keep telling you about you frame the question wrong and you're going to get the right answer. You frame the question like an environmental terrorist, you're going to, the environmental terrorist will get the answer it needs to promote against you. This is, I see this all the time. The FDA reviewed the safety and toxicity data for phthalates, including the CDC data of 2001, as well as CIR conclusions based on reviews in 1985 to 2002. While the CDC report noted elevated levels of phthalates excreted by women of childbearing age, neither this report nor the other data reviewed by the FDA established an association between the use of phthalates in cosmetic products and a health risk. Listen to all the limitations there. Only for cosmetic problems and the health risks. They didn't see any problem. And yet we have years later now a study that shows a uh, problem in IQ. The FDA reviewed something outside of their jurisdiction and they took as expert testimony the findings of another agency and this other group in order to find there was no health risk for what? Not all your phthalate intake just for cosmetics. You see the silence. You hear the silence right in how they do this. Again, this is a FDA talking about phthalates. But then they restrict it down to the questions they got about cosmetics. Instead of, how about phthalate exposure generally? And did you do any causation studies? Well, no, they don't do any. They, in fact, the CDC, you told you were, by the FDA recognizes the CDC didn't even try and this is what I'm telling you, those of you that are looking at these problems, that is the secret shield that you're not able to see through. That's why it looks so, one of the things are so formidable. Because the game is rigged, the table's rigged, the, the game is, is, is all set up and no one looked inside to see whether or not that fully fulfills what they should do. And I get to the word impacts is really important here and I just refer to that because that's one of the things that they have to balance against. And I see that in the NEPA. Any an EPA, that's typically a, applicable to all these rule rulemaking things, and they're supposed to look at the impacts. Well, if you're not looking at a study that's looking for impacts, then you're not going to find any. And if they don't look for any, then they haven't made a meaningful process. There's your other bullet point. If you don't make a meaningful process, your answers are arbitrary and capricious. There's another bullet point. If you then now, it's up to you because the way the system is, you go find this study that says, hey, now that we've looked at a causation, we have an IQ problem. Boom, there it is. Now you might be able to get that court to say, well, you've got a problem agency. You can't make this decision. It is arbitrary and capricious. You didn't even look at impacts. You make that a notice to the agency through a court order on an injunction. And you've probably done the biggest thing. You've been one of the biggest things I can imagine you could do. So I'm trying to stop this. Because that will have a ripple effect. You hit the core of the failure. And you're going to have a ripple effect as the thing moves out in all other areas. And that could be just one of you doing this. 
how the FDA has followed up. The FDA continues to monitor levels of phthalates in co cosmetic products. Again, this sounds to me like the BLM. They can monitor the use of the highway, but they have no jurisdiction over it to, to, to affect it. They just monitor, they just watch it. What are all these things? I monitor, I uh, advise, I suggest, I, I take a report. W w monitor is one of the data collection points of this, of this method of destruction. The FDA published this analytical method and uh, results in our 2004 survey in the article. And so there's a thing that they've already done. They're setting up the record, the long-standing record that you have to go look and see, did they do that actually correctly? You can challenge that by a bullet point comment. That's all it takes is that you didn't, your standard here didn't allow you to look at this. That's another bullet point statement. You write these things down point after point after point, and you start to be the one that starts to show put the pressure on them to do what they're supposed to do instead of what they've gotten away with that we all complain is causing our world to be a worse place. But we'll step up in the proper way to do it. Uh, what we know about infant exposure to phthalates. Again, FDA site, website. Infant, infants like all consumers. Infants like all consumers are exposed daily to phthalates from a number of sources including air, drugs, food, plastics, water, and cosmetics. Water? How many people drink bottled water in this country? Because they can't get it locally any good because the government don't do it for them or they don't want to drink it no more. You think you're going down and getting this water bottle for, for that, that they've stolen from you on the other side, the public-private partnership. And then what are you doing to yourself? The American Academy of Pediatrics has published an article stating that infants exposed to infant care products Specifically, baby shampoos, baby lotions, and baby powder showed increased levels in phthalate metabolites in their urine. So they see that it does this, but what happens? The study wasn't made to associate, was it? And these are, comp these are, these are agencies that are supposed to be de looking at those impacts. How can they look at the impact if they don't know causation? This is a, a silence, a screaming silence, and it's it's you. This is ubiqu. This type of silence is ubiquitous in the agencies, all of them. Like the CDC report, this study did not establish an association between these findings and any health effects. In addition, levels of phthalates, if any, in the infant care products were not determined. Apparently, there's some products that don't have them. Fine, but if any, were not determined. What are they looking at? What is the waste of time what they're doing? Why don't they make these tests so they do this? Is the silence that you need to, you can identify. You could be the one to identify it. FDA included 24 uh, children's products, child children's products intended for infants and children in the survey we completed in 2006, and nearly 50 products from infants and children in the survey we completed in 2010. What we learned not that we're going to do anything about it. What we learned was the use of phthalates and cosmetics intended for people of all ages, including infants and children, has decreased considerably since our surveys began. Here's a point where they're saying because they're being decreased, all these prior, uh, prior surveys were going to be just left to wash out because eventually they're going to be gone. But that doesn't add up to the cumulative problem. You have impacts and cumulative impacts. But since we're gonna, since the comp we see the industries are taking care of this themselves, we're not gonna really put much value in this. How do we know if there are phthalates in, cos in cosmetics you use? Well, I don't even know where this question comes from. They test for it. They know it is. But that was a, another statement. Again, if you talk about, uh, you see, they point out the cosmetics. They talk. They can make any question they want. It's irrelevant. But we're gonna talk about it. Get you to read it. Spend the time and get you to think it's important that we looked at it. When in fact they didn't, they look at it. They didn't do nothing with. It. They monitor it, but it doesn't mean that it reaches the reaches the regulation stage. And in this case, you're not going to find out what the FDA's role because that's answered here near the end, uh, near, near the middle, I guess. It's hidden in the middle. Uh, under the law, cosmetics products and ingredients, with the exception of color additives, are not subject to FDA approval before they go to market. FDA can take action against unsafe cosmetics that are on the market, but only if we have a dependable scientific evidence showing that a product or ingredient is unsafe for consumers under labeled or customary conditions of use. Well, if they're never looking at it, folks, you think that's a big blind spot? 
Do you think that no co industry or no company or anybody or even the scientists could care less? They're just going to do the test they're told to take. They're not looking and saying, hey, maybe that test didn't do an impact. Maybe it didn't find an association because it wasn't looking. And so at that point, we're never going to get to the point of proving these products are harmful. And so I'll stop right here, move on. Again, these ubiquitous phthalates, what's, they've been allowed into our system. I just read to you the FDA's no jurisdiction over them generally and how they treated it by telling you what other agencies didn't do. They didn't make a study to find the association to be able to determine impact determine an impact. In my mind, that, that's a failure of the due process right there. That would be good enough to shut the, the rule they're making or the process they are making until they make an inclusion for the causation. And uh, they, they can't say that it hasn't been done. They would be having the commission to have it done. And that has to be on open in an open forum as well. Uh, move on. As I was moving through, I found someone who was talking uh, who was a skeptic as to how these phthalates are being uh, promoted uh, as being harmful. And I, I know, and this was written before the IQ study, and I suppose that could be attacked, all this stuff. My point is that, that study now shows you a, there's a crack in the porcelain of all this. Uh, but there was an interesting, I thought it was an interesting study, to look at another side, someone who's, not, who's skeptical that any of these phthalates have any uh, actual harm, or at least proven harm, and he makes some interesting points, I think good enough that I wanted you to see the other, other supposed other side, uh, even notwithstanding this IQ problem. A hard to pronounce, hard to spell, and unjustly attacked uh, was this phthalates. And a uh, gentleman goes through and explains a little bit of the, of the history of this. And again, he tells you how to pronounce it. You just remove the PH, it's silent. And he gives you a nice little reason for... Uh, or uh, r proof, I mean, excuse me, explanation of what it's all about. Then he does this interesting thing. He talks about uh, Greenpeace and what Greenpeace did as a history before they attacked phthalates. And I'm not, I would go with the fact that they're a problem, not that they're not. What I wanted to point out is something that he exposes in this discussion about Greenpeace, environmental terrorist group, that what their p political actions are, uh, and, what, and I thought this was important because you need to know this as part of the battlefield of what goes on. And whenever I told you about the stakeholders and stalking horses, and they bring the wrong argument, they brought, bring it in, you think it's something, and it's not even an issue at all, uh, and, and, and yet they want to make an environmental condition of it and wrap up a lot of hype around it. Uh, that This in was an interesting part of the segue to get to the phthalates that now Greenpeace is on, which is the problem about the phthalates. If they start getting it too hard in the wrong direction, the agency will be covered in how it it will deal with it the way you see the silence working. And Greenpeace will be used to seal that up and we will never get at this to help us. But uh, he, he, they expose the, uh, Mr. Shaw here, uh, Dr. Shaw, states that the breaking point was a Greenpeace decision to support a worldwide ban on chlorine. I want you to think of this in context of what's going on over there in Syria and what's going on with the terrorists and all this other stuff, uh, which they found no nerve agents now in Duma. It was all chemical uh, chlorine residues. And my question, they didn't talk about where they were. They actually said they didn't know if they were actually used as a weapon. I said, well, why would they be if they were just being stored there? You'd find chlorine all over the place. It wouldn't Again, it wouldn't say it was the causative factor for some weapon. It just exists there. But Greenpeace was against chlorine. Science shows that adding chlorine to drinking water was the biggest adva advance in the hist history of public health, virtually eradicating waterborne diseases such as cholera. And the major majority of our pharmaceuticals are based on chlorine chemistry. Uh, simply put, chlorine is essential for our health. So he goes out and he exposes that Greenpeace hits something that they will rail against, uh, and they will do this on the administrative side, and they'll sue the agencies over this to try and, and stop them uh, based on their assertion. And in this case, I have to agree, that chlorine is really something very, very useful. It is a pub public health uh, aid. Uh, but again, isn't most anything properly used? And this becomes the other thing. I mean, a bomb, a chlorine bomb, is not properly used. It, it should be banned. But chlorine in the drinking water... Maybe uh, maybe we need to have some of that. Maybe we don't want these little uh, 
chlor uh, these uh, uh, cholera bacteria uh, learning how to be stronger by sucking up DNA here and there uh, as 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 it as it's allowed uh, to be to be uh, to evolve uh, while Greenpeace has its way with us uh, in a ways that are not actually right. So I say, be careful about these stocking horses and these stakeholders. Uh, but at any rate, he goes on to talk about that. I thought that was a really fascinating segue. Uh, but then he gets back to, however, PVC is far too widespread and beneficial to take down. So B Greenpeace hopes to accomplish its goal by attacking the essential phthalates using polyvinyl chloride. So they've switched, the Greenpeace has now switched to phthalates. Well, we now have, we now have a, uh, a, a, a potential cause of IQ lowering about these things. And so there's going to be a balance somewhere where they're coming up with alternatives, uh, alternative phthalates that uh, can't be, or haven't been shown to have any cause uh, at all, if I think they looked at a couple of these, that the industry is changing to. Be careful not to get into the, into the thick of a battle that's misguided or maybe not going to have any long legs, and you could step in with a comment that says that, and you could offer that the uh, that the rule that they be made that the industry transition quickly, and actually put a time constraint on that until uh, the guess you can look later in the future. So if no one's going to make it move quickly, it'll drag this thing out, and all your future progeny will have IQs uh, of uh, that are going to be less than what they could have been. You're not going to have a bunch you're have a bunch of people that are not capable of doing the fantastic imagery that we saw that we never got to see but for 50 years later. You're not going to have the people that can do that. And so I, I stopped. They, they talk about a lot of, he talks about a lot of things that you have to see. And I thought what he talked about here in analyzing the tests, of, an independent statistician was found to study incorrectly calculated p-values. That was the the possibility, the high po probability, uh, the probability factor. Uh, that here we have problems with the math. That's why they're supposed to be peer reviewed. He uses that as a finding that phthalates couldn't be shown to be wrong, uh, bad. And this is, but this is the problem with the FDA says. They said well, we can't see that it's bad. And in a way, I can see why they would do that. But when you then finally come to where a study that shows it is, what's the validity of that of the pol first policy to ne to deny? Uh, causation when it's harming actually har when you finally find out these things actually can harm you or do harm you what was the validity of that imposition is the problem of of not asserting the thing I, I was just saying that the the agencies don't even look for causation well they I think they ought to be I, or I look at this I think they should be imposed and they won't be forced to do that if none of y'all one of y'all or a couple of y'all don't step up and start to force that in them And it, it's not so, this is, seems to be a momentum that's built up in the agencies of resistance as we come on to another thing. The EPA is another agency, is hiding proof that widely used chemical causes leukemia. Now, what, we would think, why would they be holding this study back? But they are. Okay, I don't even have to want to get involved with it. Why it is. Okay, why is it that is it allowed to, as I think, we haven't had enough people with a knowledge, not a Greenpeace, and not an industry insider, or not a scientist that's subject, someone that's impartial but doesn't, looks out at an, if you can, an imp, because you're going to be affected by the phthalates, aren't you? But you look out in an impartial manner, and you say, no, no, we're going to reorient how this works so that we can mitigate the harm that the agencies do in allowing Greenpeace or a industry specialist in without a third party uh uh, um, third-party objective basis. During a Senate hearing in late January, Ed Markey asked the then EPA director, Scott Pruitt, uh, about a little rumor that he'd overheard, quote, it's my understanding, the Massachusetts senator said, that the EPA has finalized its conclusion that formaldehyde causes leukemia and other cancers and that the completed new assessment is ready for release to the public, but is being held up. You know, my understanding is similar to yours, Pruitt replied. 
Formaldehyde is one of the most ubiquitous industrial chemicals in the United States. You get the, the ubiquity here. These things are, uh, this stuff, this compound is everywhere. It's in everything that that gets made, not everything. It's it's in all things around around you. There's going to be, uh, no matter where you look, there's going to be a, a formaldehyde uh, utilizing the process of its existence. Uh, it's been much, it's as much in the wood furniture that Americans sit in, the body washes they clean themselves with, and uh, for those who live in the vicinity of major refinery, the air that they breathe. And here, the director of the agency responsible for protecting the American people from toxic chemicals was saying under oath that he was vaguely aware of a report linking formaldehyde to a variety of terminal illnesses. Well, they just you just heard how they do it. They just study the ex existence of the chemical, not the association to disease. And so this study, I don't like the way this, this report goes on because it's, it's kind of, it's attempting more to beat down the administration than what I would have you read to start seeing how they go about passing through or, res or obstructing access to information that would fulfill what they're actually supposed to do and they're getting away with it. So I'm saying this is also, as I said, evidence that the system itself is allowing this obstruction. And until there becomes more force to, st to witness that it's like this, in a way, I'm not saying do this, maybe this is you could try this, support Markey in his attempt to get the report out or let him know that you are interested to make sure this stuff is disclosed. There's no reason. Now that you know it's there, you could actually sue to get it to uh, be ex uh, disclosed if it's already in final. If you got a, if you get more information about how this works, you could actually uh, get get this to be pressed forward. But here's a ubiquitous chemical that is now found by the report internal to the agency that it does cause a harm. And what are they doing? If you go read the story, it's it's the cat box cover up right now. They're trying to figure out, uh, they're trying to figure out how to make it uh, so that the companies don't have liability. It's all about the bottom line as well. You'll see this over and over and over. To my mind, I'm not worried. Focused on the bottom line, that point. I'm just saying that's the the mo that's the reason, and we need to cut through that a lot better. Or uh, you, your little ones, you and your little ones are living in a, a literally the a polluted polluted world, all for the bottom line. Now, we could sit back and let it let it get away, uh, but I don't see how that does behooves anybody any li any bit. We if we live in this in the United States of America, without part of the part of the deal was that we were to keep the republic, we were to keep the standard, we were to keep the thing that we were gave, which when I get to the property law stuff is pretty remarkable in the world. In fact. No other that we at least the world I've read, no other nation in the history of man has had this capacity in people, in property, in land. And then the system that was sit there sits there to protect that, not interfere, but protect. I get I mean these people. Everybody gets a this position all messed up too. As I told you before, the government, when you look at it the way it's supposed to work, was really to protect you, not protect and serve. It was to provide a place for you, people with disagreements, a, a neutral place to get them ironed out. In fact, I tell you, with the law of disposal, for example, by patents, it, it's so clearly written that in one state it says that the judiciary has no place when an issue of patent is on, on the, in evidence. No jurisdiction. That's how hands-off that law is. In other words... There is no oppression and violence that can come from the government upon that. That there is, is a different problem and a problem that we were to stop. And I think that comes from not many people understanding what's going on. And they go off and they, 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 you know, whatever you want to call themselves, they go out and they try to invent the world. And they, and they don't realize that, that the rightness of the world was there. It was abandoned. And you're not looking in the right spot, so you're inventing it. You're inventing something no more helpful than what the oppression and occupation that's on you. And what my research found, we go back to those, there's very, there's not very many of them, and they don't need to be, protections that sit there. They're, what they are are shields against interference. Now, for me, instead of trying to argue I know so much, I'd rather just use that shield. 
I'd rather just use the statute that's printed that says, Thou shalt not touch. That, that's to me the anymore. That's the simple thing. I don't, I don't need to be so knowledgeable anymore. That's good enough for me. And I don't know why more people don't want to do it that way, like looking at an agency that's supposed to look out for your uh, d disease, and they won't look at the cause for disease. What is that? That's a fit. To me, I don't, I've never even heard somebody respond to this, like a court or anybody, some one-man opinion or one-woman opinion in the, in the form of a costume called a judge, saying that that would even be not viable. H how are they not doing, right facially, not doing what they're there to do, and that, that's good enough? It's astonishing to me that no one else caught it. But in Geek Pong going here, the court decision could lead to EPA banning water fluoridation. Is I think an old story that I told you, report that I told you about. What we're, it's making the news again. I find it, what's amazing in social media, what comes around, uh, uh, keeps coming around months and months and years uh, uh, later, that it keeps coming around like it's a brand new story. But what was important about this uh, in the context, again, with the EPA holding back a report was that they were sued over making a decision that someone did not feel was proper. And the, when that was pre presented to the court, the court agreed that it, the, the, the agency's position was improper. It's along the lines of what I, kind of what I've been saying, how you go about doing this. This is a, uh, this report is a, is showing you the evidence of the, of what you're there to do once you get involved, what the, the, the steps are. Uh, this is one of the things that might happen if you set your record up or to challenge the record. You challenge the experts. You challenge the generality of the experts' studies. You challenge the purpose of the studies. You challenge the findings as to being specific to uh, more important things like the causation. Uh, you, you go through and you make the record for these things, and then you assert them as a failure that when they weren't done, it'll, it made allowed the EPA to skirt an obligation and duty that it had. In this case, a lawsuit proceeded. Uh, the EPA interpreted the language of the law to mean the judge should be limited to reviewing information the EPA provided when it decided to reject the petition of, uh, of 2017. Quote, the disagreement is whether in reaching its own decision, the court may consider information that the EPA did not have access to uh, for instance, expert testimony, news studies, documents obtained in discoveries, etc. Michael Conant, the attorney representing the coalition, told the uh, Bloomberg Environment before the ruling. Uh, in the de denying the EPA's motion of to say that that can't be done, the courts sp specifically held that the phrase de novo proceeding indicates that Congress intended a broad scope of review because the word proceeding encompasses all regular activities of lawsuits, including discovery beyond the administrative record because the purpose of the TSCA is to protect the public from chemicals that pose unreasonable risks of health and the environment, and the court held the quote, a de novo proceeding in district court modeled after traditional trial-like proceedings would not conflict with the purpose of the TSCA, but would instead effectuate it. That statement is huge here. Huge. It's huge. This is talking, telling you that if they don't do inside, if their record is made purposely to not look at things that they're duty bound to see, you can stop that. You can bring, make them have to go. You can't. You can't fix them. This is not like you changing what they did, but they have to go back and redo the process, and they have to take consideration of these things that they that you, that they did. And this is the importance of this case. This is really confirming what I've been telling you all along. And this is what you have to look forward to. I find it fascinating that this is even a question. But here's what they, they, they rely on the silence of that, of what would th you would think would be just common sense. De novo means a new, a new trial. No, my experience with de novo trials on review, they don't do that. So this is really even more amazing than I think most of you might appreciate. That the court actually is saying, no, we're going to have a new trial here. That's something I've never seen a court do underneath a review for de novo. They just want, they know that if they do, they're going to have to be holding a full-scale trial again, a whole new trial. Know that they what they do is they make it up as they go, and then they go on the record anyway. 
this is truly a big a big decision here. But for our purposes today, you see that they you find the word de novo proceeding on a review in an agency process due process uh, legislation. And you have this power to bring the agency to heel where it's not doing things that its purpose was, in fact, made for. It says it right there. You just heard me read it. I won't go on more. Like I said, we can read. I could go on and read. This thing goes on to discuss fluoride. You, both to the, singing to the choir on that. I, I'm talking now, using these, these reports, these, these media, social reports, these opinions, as evidence of, the, of your license, if you need one, how the, the doorway you open to go through. And it's right here in these stories if you know if you know what you're looking at. To me, it, these things are in my mind as I'm looking and analyzing. What I'm asking you to do is look at these and put them in your mind so that you look into an analysis. When you're reading through somebody's uh, some agency's discussion, you're making this analogy, analysis all the time. You're laying these out in your mind. You have your bullet points as you analyze something, a problem, and then analyzed against what they brought in. And you're saying, what didn't get put in that they ought to? What are they ignoring? What's the silence in this problem? If, if they're, this says right here, if their job is to protect health, if they're not looking at causation, how do they have a standard, first of all, and why aren't they doing the causation studies? I, I think this is a, I don't even know what to call it. It's not a silver bullet, but boy, this is getting real close to shooting a silver bullet in, in, into the heart of the werewolf. Oh, no, that's a stake. Maybe it's a wooden stake I'm after. See, the point is I don't know. It's not a proof. What it is, it's getting a lot closer to what hasn't been done to keep these agencies back and put them back into where they were supposed to do. We've allowed them to dictate to us their condition. The courts have made that easy, but you see here, this is a, such an important decision what was made. I just read, just, just what I just read is such an important statement. And to me, it's even it's, it's even larger because... I've been in plenty of, of reviews at a at a court review, uh, even if it's a, a sub, inferior court to a, another a superior court, uh, a higher court, in the same court. They will not do de novo like you've just heard this court wanting to make it happen. He want or her, whoever this judge is, is going to take and make a real trial out of this now. And in that trial, it's a new, a new, in a judicial capacity. And now you get to bring your information in. You get to bring in all the evidence that wasn't put. It has to be relevant to the point. They can wrestle you over that one. But you, if you're on point, you're going to bring it. And it, this judge will be overlooking that point in the power that the legislature has given to that court. How that's not okay with some people, that that's an objective basis written down and that we can rely on, and instead of throwing it out, I don't understand. I'm not making it up. I don't have to go through long-winded passages on all I know. I just say, no, de novo means new trial. Judge, give us a new trial. I got some evidence that they, won't, they will not consider. Now you see the purpose of the court. And this decision says that. This decision says the new trial is required to bring in the evidence that they would not look at, the things they would not do, because it effectuates the purpose of the legislation. I guess I'll stop right there. It's enough said. I don't know why I, uh, what I can do to tell you folks this is the keys. These are the keys to the kingdom. You got to pick them up and you got to put them in the door. You got to turn it. You got to push the door open. If you just sit back and just even listen to me and say that sounds cool, that's not going to be good, good, good enough. And yet here they are, right here. Someone else has just done this. This is actually the more I think about that case, I reported on it. We didn't have that. I reported that it was happening. That the court was allowing the case to go forward. Now the question is, can the court even do it? And the judge has just said, yeah, de novo allows me to do that. That's what the Congress intended the review for, complete review. I can't tell you how big that statement is because that's normally not what goes on. Yet it's, it's supposed to happen, and yet no one presses that point. No, they get off on the weeds. They do all kinds of other things. They argue uh, over the over the minu what I call the minutia. They get lost in stuff like what Greenpeace would bring up. Uh, like someone uh, we used to say, they talk about the they talk about the color of the drapes on the windows instead of talking about from the foundation. Here's another story that came through, and it's right on the things I've been telling you. My concerns. It's, uh, I'm I'm a science and technology guy. I I think it's the coolest stuff since uh, sliced white bread and and ice. 
but there's problems that you have to look at. My problem with the gene editing is now coming forward. There's more and more reports. How long are we going to go allowing this stuff? I don't know because I don't know how many of you are going to sit back and just say, oh, we see it's wrong and complain and not really step forward, not really step forward within reading the go to the rules, go to the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, whether that's the state one or the federal one. They're consistent, but they're different for their, for their jurisdictions. Read it and start understanding the rules of navigation. Yes, the Admiralty stuff. The rules of navigation for an, an administrative proceeding, and then go read the rules of the, the re review, and then where that goes into a trial. And prepare your cases in order to go there. If you're not capable on your own, then do the footwork to prepare a case to get somebody there. But here's comment on CRISPR cancer link suspected by macros to Toledo. What comes to mind when I read... And they talk about John Rappaport's um, uh, report about this CRISPR technology that I've told you have problems. It's the unintended consequences. It's nature defending itself. It's the marvelous thing that nature does in defending itself against attack, something that we the people have stopped doing. We've been so, many, so invaded by so many places, we've just stopped responding. And that's going to be to our detriment, harm, or death. Uh, but here's a report. You get it through, again, Twitter. You can get my comments or my observations on things periodically uh, through the Twitter at the behind a woodshed, those of you that might be interested. Uh, again, I don't, I'm really not finding social media to be so social, but there it is. It's where people seem to go. If I can get a couple people to see the stuff, that's the only reason why I'm dropping stuff, uh, things into there. There might be something, somebody taking note. Uh, so I have a handful of, just literally not even a handful of people that respond uh, to the Twitter things that I do. We're all kind of in the same field of looking at things, and so it's just passing information. But for the general the general purpose of it, not many people actually look at the, the details of all this. They don't look at the, at the factual side. They don't look at applying the law. They don't look at the problems that are going on. I do that throughout the week when I see things uh, that I think have a... There's not necessarily just the story. It has evidence of things for us. But here, this one came through to re, re, someone looking at John Rappaport's information. Now, he wants to talk about that to his people. CRISPR cancer link suspected. Okay, suspected. The point is, is if it's suspected there's a study for causa potential causation, you're going to have to go through the scientific understanding of whether that's going to be enough. But if they have not looked at this case, if there's a provision in the review for that agency for de novo, you just got the other case, the other case now in EPA that says, no, de novo means a full trial. And we need to put this evidence in that they will not look at of causation, which then means that they didn't look at impacts or cumulative impacts, and they therefore also don't have a standard to even begin the causation. I just gave you five points right there that you would just write in a list and send it in. Lick, well, I guess you don't have to lick the mail in the stamps anymore. You press the stamp and send it in time on a point. But this a gentleman that goes through Joseph, uh, what is his name? Joseph Farrell. Uh, reads John Rappaport's information. So here's the ripple effect. And he, he gets to this idea of when he reads this stuff from John Rappaport, it makes him think of things. Well, that's just bringing out the idea I've been telling you that th th there's knowledge out there that's being ignored by these agencies that these uh, things that they do in technology have side effects, have ripple effects, have cumul cumulative effects, uh, combined effects. Not, cumul not just cumulative, but combined and then they have effects with other things. That here's another guy coming on uh, utilizing information that's already on the Internet to gives you a list of particular things that you could address in bullet point line item form that you could be the only, the first one in the world in this issue to put forth the right comment. And they'll, they'll look at that. They may dismiss you. And if you feel strongly enough about your position, if you feel that the, the study that was not made to look at causation but, but existence is not within the, the confines of the need uh, for the agency, then they were required to do that. And they say, no, you get to take that to a court. And in this, if it was the EPA, I don't know the laws now, which one has de novo, which may not. You have to look for that. But on the de novo power, they have, they have a court case that says, no, the court's supposed to relook at that and take that new evidence in and then determine it. You see the check and balance right there, too. Agency doesn't want to be embarrassed that way. And yet you set the standard as well. 
And so I'm saying that we, it's within, I think it's within our capacity. I really do. It sounds, it's daunting. I, I, I get that. But I think once you start to look at this like I look at it, you cut through all the stuff you don't need. You start looking at the things they're not saying. All of a sudden, it, another a thing comes out of it. You see another thing develop. And so there's more information here. I just wanted to uh, comment that there's people seeing this problem with the CRISPR. We now have a potential causation. Uh, those of you that are involved with this uh, and the GMO, I told you I'm not necessarily in, against GMO. I'm not necessarily against uh, vaccines, although we have these lingering, dangling chads that I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't necessarily like. But see, when you're looking at those, remember what you're up against. You're looking up solving a problem where a terminal condition, a worse terminal condition, is is at risk, and so when I when I say I'm looking at maybe a vaccine may not be so bad or a GMO may not so be, be bad, it means you have no other choice essentially. It's either lose whatever it is you're doing, or you may be able to pro, uh, get yourself to go down the road a little ways. Maybe while you're looking at other alternatives, I don't know. And so put put what I'm saying in context of where it belongs in the discussion. And so. We find now that the CRISPR technology, all the problems I've been telling you about is now picked up by John Rappaport. Another guy picked up, he starts to see new problems. And I'm saying some of those problems can be put on a line item list of the pro, of, of, of imposition on an obligation to the, to the agencies that would tell them that they didn't do enough. As I, look, as I said to somebody, I think, it was a, I think it was on a Twitter, they didn't take a hard look enough. And that hard look is not my statement. The hard look is what the courts say the agencies have to take. They have, and, the, and the green, the terrorists, are really good at this. They, they say, well, they didn't take a hard look enough. Okay, you use that. That's right. They need to take a meaningful look at this with all the information that would bring them to that determination. Not the outcome they were planning. That's the felony. No, what they were supposed to be doing. If no one's focusing anybody on this, it will never, ever happen like it hasn't happened until today. And so we have uh, things, again, that are going to be are passing by us. Uh, agencies are allowing it because no one's actually putting in the right argument. Like, I mean, my experience on this is strictly, as I tell you, going through the mining law, the coordination power of the Jefferson Mining District, and we put a coordination demand in, and we explain all the failures that of the agency uh, that the agency did to, to failed to do, we completely throw the monkey wrench. Complete little monkeys that we are, we throw our monkey wrench in there, and it completely messes up their machine. We put big old logs in their spokes fast. Now the coordination power is a little different than a comment, but you have the same power ultimately. It's just two steps. It's two steps before you get there in a comment side. You have to wait till they respond and then not properly. You have to do the analysis and then you do your filing to enjoin that process. Uh, where as a as a coordinator, I just have to say, you didn't coordinate. That, that was a facial violation right there. It's done, and, and, and we can do that pretty quickly on the on the fact of the publication without the coordination. So we we work a, there's a little differently here, and I don't want to get everybody confused. Uh, but I do want to comment that depending on how you come at this. Uh, that you there's a power here of check and balance it's there that last epa case is really uh, really a, a marvelous statement it's just the law though that it's being stated shows you how much the agencies and people and, and uh, stake stakeholders uh, using stocking horses have gotten away with the uh, with their crimes it's all i can see uh, so as i was speaking about cancer spreading because of you know, the ubiquitous nature of all of our uh, our things in the world and no one really uh, giving the the, sh the doubt to the to the uh, to the bottom line if you will uh, those that make the profit uh, the another thing came up here i'm kind of moving just a little bit over from uh, one type of a cancer to a different one i found this little story interesting hitler's commando lieutenant colonel otto scorzeni worked as an assassin for the israeli intelligence uh, that title just kind of confused me. Uh, Hitler's commando working for Israeli intelligence. It, it's an interesting story. But it shows you uh, all is fair in love and war. And it shows you that a lot of this stuff that we hear, this cancer that's now growing in the, in the Middle East, uh, it, it's not pure. It, it's part of a geopolitical tool, as I keep pointing out. The people in the so-called Hitler's commandos are now uh, agents, working as agents, and they're, everyone's used as they will be. And this is this story that I, of that title. It's very interesting to read through to see what what 
groups of people do with other people and how they take advantage. And I want to point out that's going on all the time. All the time. There's no special people here. There's no chosen people. There's a bunch of criminals using other criminals to get what they want. And unless there's some resistance to it, it go, it's going to go down. It goes into the stinking abyss. Nothing seems to go up in this world on its own. You really have to put a lot of a lot of effort into it. But one of the people that stood up out of here was Adolf Eichmann, and I found it very interesting. Now here, some of you, what was it, the um, Mandela effect or something? I'm not so sure. I don't get into that. Uh, where you thought one thing was something, and then in the future it, it's different. Well, I distinctly remember reporting on Adolf Eichmann and reading from you some sources that said <clears throat> essentially that Adolf Eichmann was a Jew. He was an SS officer. He was Hitler's top SS officer dealing with the Jews. Now, I read all of that to you. And since then, I haven't had any comment back to me about the error, any error. And I went back and I said, okay, well, let me here is his name again. Let's go revisit this new story about Mossad getting this Hitler... Uh, commando back. How is all this integrating now? And do you know, I went back and read about Adolf Eichmann, and there's no report anywhere that said that he was a Jew now? So, what do you call that? Interesting. Is there a washing of the internet? That certainly could be. I don't think it's the Mandela effect. I don't think I read to you wrongly. I read it right from what we were talking about. And yet now, it's ch the story about Adolf Eichmann showing that he was a part of this has changed. When I'm looking at a story that says that Mossad used uh, Hitler's commando to go kill people for them. In particular, Egypt on a, a nuclear thing because they were threatened. I, I guess the point here is that we got this cancer somewhere growing. And they're utilizing all the techniques of all the people uh, that claim that they are the chosen people, that they are this, that, and the other. They're, they're, we're all supposed to give them a space, and they're just as big a criminal, utilizing all the same other criminals, war criminals, as all the other ones are doing. And they're all up to no good. And yet I find inside the story, and I'll, maybe I'm, now I'm in error from what I reported to you before, but I find it very interesting that I did read it to you, and now the the connection of Eichmann has now been removed. Even though there's more evidence here that shows what Hitler was trying to do, this was a plan to move, make Zion, the Zionistas. He was in on that plan. And this was, you read this thing, this, this, this tale of this, this guy, this Skorzeny, it's all about how that was going to happen even though he was a, a Hitler soldier. And so I find this an another anomaly, uh, two anomalies within this one. The change of the, re of the referencing that I was doing for you on the air as now not existing to be very fascinating, if nothing else. But for me, it's just the same thing. We got cancer spreading in the world, and no one looks at the cause, do we? No matter where you go, government will not look at the cause. You heard that. Over and over, you heard the FDA say, well, the CDC looked at this, but they were not intending to look at the cause. We just wanted to know the existence. How much can we pollute these people with? <laughs> it's exactly what they're doing. Remember, Title 50, the Clean Water Act, all this says we get to pollute a little bit within within toleration of those that we're, we're, we're utilizing as the re, human resource, the human capital that we're, we're sponging parasitically off of. It's just fascinating to me. Again, this cancer now spreading out, it's a tool. I just found this story fascinating. I'm going to stand corrected at the point that I don't see that uh, Eichmann was, uh, was now uh, characterized that way, but see, now it develops another one that has makes no sense that Mossad is Jews were using now Hitler's guys to do what they wanted. Seems to be a reoccurring story of deception and uh, intrigue and crime worldwide, geopolitical crime. Um, another horror, uh, now moving on completely different now, more into uh, the horrors of life, uh, the horror that we saw, the cancer and horror that we see befalling the, God, the Palestinians and, and the people of Syria 
and, and what it took to get back to Syria, for the most part, they still got a long way to go, but they're coming back. Uh, what the United States is doing to muck it all up, uh, what they're not doing uh, in dignity and honor in the world to uphold all these standards that we thought were shiny and bright. Uh, one thing is natural law will affect you, uh, something in your health, something that you don't really want to get into, a horror, I guess, if you get this. I want to just quickly remind you, for those of you that live there, you probably know all about it, but for those of you that don't and may go visit, beware. Horror plant causes third-degree burns, blindness, and spreading in upstate New York. If you didn't know about it, I wanted to tell you this was a, one of those things that kind of hit you by surprise. Uh, there's a plant out there that makes poison ivy reaction look like a few minor pimples, according to the New York Department of Environmental Conservation. It is spreading all over upstate New York. Giant hogweed is an invasive species, and it's a federally recognized noxious weed. It's been called a horror plant because contact with it can cause painful burns, permanent scarring, and even blindness. And if the, that wasn't bad enough, it wreaks havoc on plants and soil whenever it, wherever it spreads. Uh, look it up, folks. If you don't know, you can get the link in the broadcaster. This stuff is uh, a photoreactive. Uh, so I would say if you're going to deal with it, uh, deal with it in the dark and make sure you wash everything off. But even so, you're going to react to this thing. It really is dangerous. It, it causes these third-degree burns, but it'll actually chew up your skin and it causes it sits there for months and months as a problem. So I just I ran across that. I forgot about this plant, uh, but they're saying it's spreading. I guess that's the alarm for me. For those of you that don't know about it, uh, and they said there were some stories that people didn't know about it, it really can do you some harm. So uh, learn what to do. The people that are studying it use hazmat suits uh, in order to deal with it. So uh, on, uh, And on the other hand, I found that some people would actually eat it when it's small, which is an interesting thing. And I'm going to suggest to you as well, when you look at the constituent chemicals that are in this plant, notwithstanding how dangerous it is, and go look at what those chemicals can do, when we talk about making cancers and we talk about not being disclosure and not doing the studies that we should be doing, and then you start looking at this plant that's now become invasive from another place and actually can be harmful if you mistreat it, you look at the chemicals that this plant makes, and I'm wondering why it is now that they're wanting to destroy it. And you find out that it has this uh, anti-cancer capacity, antiviral capacity, and it's very strong. A strong medicine requires very wise uh, uh, handling. I don't know enough about it. All I wanted you to know is don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Uh, maybe get a professional. I mean, you don't have to. I would deal with it. But my point is, is that there's uh, nature's out there, and nature will protect itself. But nature can also provide things to us if we look at it right and don't try to, uh, well, be smarter than Mother Nature. She'll she'll hurt you. But to those of you that it's over there, be careful. This is a big giant plant. You can't almost can't miss it. Uh, it's uh, four, seven to fourteen feet. Has a big uh, umbral white flowers. It's a it's part of the carrot family. Uh, but don't 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 think it is a carrot. And uh, be cautious out there, folks. Uh, moving on. Uh, what environment would you have these big monstrous plants but uh, you know a nice warm environment with a high concentration of carbon uh, where we would have maybe even expect big monstrous animals like dinosaurs uh, and what kind of an environment have we had before but an environment that was twice as carbon had twice as atmosphere had twice as much carbon and plants that were giant plants like the hog giant hogweed big giant plants uh, what kind of an environment was that but uh, the hothouse environment? And yet all life still existed and, I can, should I say, thrived. And you know where I'm moving with this whole uh, thing as we are, are given what the scientists will give us, as we got what the government gave us in the pictures, uh, this grainy old um, printout of, uh, of what the moon looked like with the earth and uh, how how little they would actually, uh, how repressed we are in our knowledge and uh, yet we essentially we if we can say it we pay for it all. Uh, we have been also destroyed by more repression, more oppression, and more science that isn't. Uh, people who study and frame the question in a way that they won't come to what they need to, and they're part and parcel in the public-private partnershiping of this thing that works with agency and with government and with legislation and with psyop and with other, all the other stakeholders involved, but. But we find now new evidences, new studies, where there's finally people, over time now, it's finally come out. For In this case, 40 new scientific papers say global warming does not exist. All right, so 
Hundreds of scientists involved in 40 recent scientific, scientific papers say the scare about global warming is based on hysteria and false science. Okay, you heard me say that, singing to the choir here. The point is that there's more scientists finally coming out. It takes years for the momentum to start to shift. And it, it, this is what it takes. It takes people standing up against the momentum, against what looks to be normal, like the normalization of ignorance. Look at the things that aren't said. Look at the things that are not said correctly. Look at who is saying it. Start thinking, really critically thinking. Well, if, the, if this agency or this consensus is supposed to find this, why wouldn't they find it if they're not? Look, why wouldn't they find what they want instead of what they're supposed to be doing if they get away with it? Now 40 scientific papers come over that say global warming is, is a hoax. I say it's a felony. It's a crime. Uh, this starts out a whole bunch of other things. You know, the carbon tax, a new economy, all down to the molecule. It's just a big, uh, a, a big parasite, uh, completely debunkable before we even get to these studies. But here's more evidence for those of you. Uh, I can't even call people skeptics. See, it's a fraud. I'm not a skeptic. I'm a witness to a crime here. Now, I've got my way to show it and my way to explain it, and I don't have to get into the discussions of someone who's trying to perpetrate a fraud on me. And so, But we all have our own discussion about it. I don't really discuss it too much. Uh, as I've said it before, this is the a, a, a hypothe- a, a, a relationship uh, of a statistical relationship of a hypothesis that has never even been close to proven. And the na- natural world is so much more dynamic. And first of all, they don't regard the sun. And so, th- th- I don't have to. I don't want to go back and all prove this out again. But it takes a momentum. It takes years. But it takes people stepping up and doing what it takes in the way it takes in order to uh, cause the system itself, the more wrongly oriented system, to take notice. We've heard. In the, we've also just heard in the EPA de novo review, there's checks and balances. And what I'm telling you what that means is, notwithstanding any corruption that we've I've seen in the past, we now have one court case that actually imposed the law of a real trial and says no, more evidence can come in. And this gives us the, the ob- observation, if nothing more, if, even if this late, there are checks and balances in the system that have been ignored, obstructed, denied uh, for whatever reason that if we're not don't have a whole lot of people talking and looking in this way and framing it correctly the wrongly framed condition is given the right answer and we'll lose every time on that so this is a again we have more scientific papers coming on Uh, I don't want to make it a tip for a tat I don't even want to make it a balancing feature Uh, the fact is that when you started and framed a condition with the wrong uh, definition, you're not going to get to where you want to go. It, it's just not going to be happening. Uh, I don't. I mean, I went. I was going to go back through and do some more stuff uh, on the climate change issue. I went back and looked at definitions and all this. You just there's nothing in the paperwork that is so objective. Nothing. When you go back through and see one thing relates to something else, like climate system is part of a definition of another definition, and they never define what a climate system is. They say and they refer back to the first definition that that it relates to. You're not looking at anything objective. You're looking at a con game. And so I I don't even get into the argument about it yet. Look at all the energy of hundreds of scientists making 40 papers in order to claim it's a hoax, at least by this author. No, this is a massive global fraud. A massive global fraud. The paperwork and definitions, actually, they mention the solar point, and yet they don't include it as part of the cause. The, the, the solar uh, thing is not even part of the climate system. It's what, uh, in fact, that's what I was looking at it for. I started re-looking at it because I'm wondering why people that are so-called skeptics or understand uh, can at least intelligently talk about climate change, they actually use the word forcing. In fact, one of the kids that's doing this, I asked him, "Why do you use the word forcing?" I haven't got an answer on this. Uh, I'm losing my, uh, I'm losing. He's losing integrity in my mind. There's got to be an answer for this. Why do you use forcing if you don't already agree that it can be forced? And if you're using forcing, then you don't think that the sun is natural to the system. In fact, when you look at the definition, that the, the sun's not there, 
they start from a steady state. Where does the energy come from that would cause any temperature? You're starting from a frozen planet. Everything's global warming from there. But anyway, we'll get into that discussion more than to say, if you look, we've got to get beyond our discussion, our argument, our, our dismissal even. We have, they, the government, the seats of decisions are using these so-called hoaxes, these frauds, to support, to not find causality. What you hear is rip over and over in these agencies, even one agency telling and telling you that the other one didn't. It wasn't even intended. That's a powerful statement. What did I say about using one agency against the other? That's where you use it. You say, well, they admit that they didn't intend to do causation. They're there to do impact. One of the requirements is impacts and cumulative impacts. Why didn't they just waste money, misappropriate funds to do some study that just showed existence and not causation? That's another d d point. See, you just build up on all this logic starts to build. So here's uh, no, more studies if you wanted to, to know more scientific studies that you can bring in when you see, uh, like, let's say, these, uh, the, we need these smart meters because we have to battle climate change. Boom. You're right, you're right in there. Boom. Right? So this is, you just use it totally out of the wall, off the, off the left field. You come in and you say, no, there is no climate change right here. You, you didn't have a right to use that as an excuse to, to extort from me even an opt-out statement. So now we're one judge, I'm going to move a little bit here, move on to one judge, tells you what de novo means and is willing to fully, fully impart that, fully effectuate what de novo means, a new trial, new evidence, new witnesses, new everything, re-looking at the core of the problem that you complained of. We have judges that, uh, by this statement, uh, judges run amok, an expose, I found this uh, pretty fascinating. This is from a federal defense attorney uh, who got got himself in some trouble when he exposed this problem about judges running amok. It's the problem that I'm used to when we go to a court and you say, but the review is de novo, and they say we looked at I, I look at the, the the record before before the agency or I look the record before the magistrate judge and I find in favor I affirm that decision. That's not a de novo trial, but that's all you get. Then you take that to appeal, and you say, but I didn't get the de novo. Then they change the question on you, if you get in. If they don't change the question on you, and you don't ever get to there. Why? Because it's, you start proving for yourself, if you've never seen this before, what the systemic obstruction is. But there's an attorney inside, the criminal defense a lawyer, who tells us where the problems might start to be. This is more particular to criminal law. But to me, it doesn't matter. These judges wear many hats. They all listen to a crime a case right after they right before they listen to uh, possibly an equity action or, or anything else or whatever whatever kind of issue they're looking at. Uh, as a federal criminal defense lawyer, I get front row tickets from the imploding hot mess that is the United States of America. I've saved a seat for you. No one will be surprised to hear the desk. Is stacked, the deck is stacked against individuals facing criminal charges in federal court, but the real problem goes far beyond what you think. It's more than just how the rules of evidence and procedure are written to benefit the government and secure convictions. It's more than just how the system skews toward the prosecution over the defense. In everything from judicial interpretation to the Bail Reform Act, parenthetically which was once intended to reform the bail process to insurmountable jury instructions that end up swallowing human conduct like a black hole, to draconian sentencing guidelines that lead an unnecessarily to unnecessarily long sentences. The problem is that many judges, the very people who are d supposed to ensure the evidence is played down the middle, demonstrate bias against defense advocacy. Unfairness becomes acute in cases involving people who need court-appointed counsel due to lack of funds to retain an experienced trial lawyer costing 50000 to 100000 or more. Indigent defendants could comp comprise almost 90% of the federal criminal caseload nationwide. I'm going to stop there. You really need to see what uh, uh, Zoe Dolan talks about here. I'll go back into this point Take the very first paragraph where he goes through one after the other failures that were supposed to go on. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. If you don't understand that these these so-called judges 
are violating these very provisions, that they're there at all. If you don't see that, you have no way to compare this silence that you're seeing evidenced by an attorney him, herself or himself. So is an interesting specimen. Uh, that we have from someone on the inside, as I told you before when I was dealing with the minor uh, issue with a, a defense attorney, they have no, I'm not saying Zoe does, but the other defense attorney had a blind spot to appeasing the prosecution. You see here, it's as we understand, it's totally stacked in the government's favor. What I tell you is how do I unwrap that? It's in the agencies, too. When you see this discussion that the judge actually steps in finally and says, no, it says de novo, Congress intended a complete review, even to include full new trial with evidence. You're looking at an anomaly in the system that is allowed to go off the track where we were supposed to be on it, uh, to keep it on it. And we are made foreign to our own system. And we tend to lead ourselves foreign to that system. We tend to find it easier, and it is easy to go elsewhere and do nothing, apathy. But we have just as easy a fantasy we create. And then we just don't engage it correctly. And I've had to go through the part where they're, when they're coming after your property, you better be able to defend yourself is all I can tell you. So my it was necessity really that calls me here as well. Those of you that don't have it or don't want to step into it, don't think that there's an imperative. And after being through it and seeing how, how comprehensive this is, and then you see confirmation of it from someone that's working on the inside who actually gets in trouble for trying to expose it, you can see how big a problem that we have. It really is all hands on deck here that's a necessity thing. It's not my, my thinking, oh, you just go need to go do something. No, this is an all-hands-on-deck problem. And until we get a lot of this fixed uh, and we do it, we, we're the only voice that says the frames it correctly and gets it done. We're not going to get what we need to get, and we're going to be all mentally retarded people with offspring that's mentally retarded with cancers and tumors and whatever all else that we're do, doing, and we're mending ourselves all the time under the, the, the tutelage of a system that's utilizing you as some uh, some. Uh, like some parasite does, right? So we can make up stories in ourselves, we can do all this stuff, or else we can look at reality. And I'm going to move a little bit more in it, onto something about making up stuff. I saw this little story, it's going to move over into something else. I better not. I better not do it, because that gets us into a whole different thing, and I wanted to go through that thing completely. I've always, I get here to this point, and I, and, and I, and if I don't do this all complete, it'll be like me dropping off the moon story last week. It doesn't close off the doesn't close off the fact that we would have the we have the technology and yet we're not we're not receiving it. And that that then focuses back to the future, if you will, of the fact that the government's out there doing some pretty spectacular things and we're not aware of it, which kind of folds into what I was saying about the uh, about the technology about making the United States uh, United States uh, USS Death Star in the global dominance the United States wants to be uh, about the universe. Uh, this is a psychopathy in people. We have got to get a handle on folks. And so I'm not going to move on to the next subject matter, uh, which actually moves on to more myths, and it causes us to allow us uh, to impose upon systems things that it, those systems that we myth, uh, mystically believe are going to help us won't, I'm going to be very vague here because I don't really want to get into it, but I do want to broach it, and I want to point out how this there's a reality of of the world, and there's a reality of what we're dealing with, and there's a reality that kicks back to the agencies and how the bottom line is the bottom line, and unless you can prove contrary, uh, then then there won't be a, but they're not going to look for it. There's a simple dynamic that works consistently throughout the world, and the next story I was going to get onto. It starts to show the myths that I hear people, liberty-minded people talk about, but there's a reality behind it. And unless you get a handle on that and start seeing what the potential might be, we're, 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 just, we're just muddling around doing nothing. You're just going to think that I'm not uh, consistent. I'm not thinking uh, consistent with uh, with a, a bunch of people that might think in that way. I'm against them, or not, or I could care less, or some other way, or, oh, uh, he's different this way, and so I can disregard that. And it, it creates these divisions in all of us when, in fact, there's a reality, and we're going to be held to that. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope uh, something I said uh, gives you awareness, uh, gives you some inspiration, shows you some more guidance on how to approach some of these problems. Uh, Grimner, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com and uh, all the 
things you do for us there. And uh, over at Freedom Liber- freedomsnetwork.com, folks, donation has to go there or else the servers quit uh, on the 23rd, like they did a lot. We're going to do on last June. And uh, anybody else that's promoting the broadcast, I truly appreciate it. I really wish I knew more about all of you. I see little places here and there that pop up and, and then go away, but uh, thank you for what you do. I'll be here next week, Tech Diffs or Nature Willing.